So it's November and we are beginning our monthly focus this month, which is gratitude. It is a great one for this month of Thanksgiving. Um, normally, most Novembers, we do focus on gratitude. And in the past, um, I've talked about things like, and I will again, the benefits of gratitude, uh, principles and practices that help us live a life uh, of gratitude that make us live or that help us live gratefully. But today I want to approach this theme a little differently. I want to take a bit of a balcony view because I started thinking about it, about for me, what is the energy underlying my capacity to the extent I have it, and it comes and goes, um, to live a life gratefully? What is the underlying energy underneath that commitment? My question was, what energy lives, underlies a life lived gratefully? What, how do we see the world in a way that sends us down that path? So a lot of people may not take such a view. We see a great many people who approach life with a sense of what? Outrage, anger, resentment. It is very hard to miss those people. They are very loud. They are in your face and they seem to be all over the place. They do not seem to be living gratefully. Gratitude indeed is one option of many, but it's the option I pick even when a lot of the time it's, as we say in the law, only aspirational. What does that mean? It means that it's something I hope to be able to achieve even though I so often fall short and I step into the camp of anger and outrage and resentment, like a lot of people do. But what's important is that I come back. I say, this is not how I want to show up. This is not how I want to live. And I take a breath and I start again. We here, we at One World, we know many wise people who live their lives in the energy of gratitude. Some of you are listening. We could all give a list of people we know who we just, we just know and believe live their lives in that energy of gratitude. So for today, what I'd like to do is explore what energy for me underlies that place of gratitude. What is it, and this may resonate with you, what is it that I think about life? What is it that I know about life that leads me to approach it in gratitude or continue to try to, even though a lot of times I just fall off the rails? Some of this may sound familiar to you. I actually think that gratitude is a mix, if you will, of several ways of seeing the world. Wonder, joy, curiosity, humility, connection, and blessing. It's made up of a lot, it's like a fabric. It's made up of a lot of different threads. For me, when I am able to approach life, all of it, from a place of gratitude, the foundational perspective I feel is one of blessing. For me, I believe that life, all of it, is an ongoing, flowing, and dynamic blessing. I don't always live that way, as anybody who knows me will tell you, because I'm human and way too often I just trip all over myself. But when I can be in that energy of blessing, I know that it is true, I know that it's who I am, and I know that I am home. So I invite you to consider that for yourself. I can live gratefully when I am able to realize that life, all of it, all of creation comes from a place of divine blessing. It continues to flow out. If only I can see it, if only I can look at it with those eyes that see all things new, those eyes that can perceive the blessings around me. It's not chance, it's not good luck, but it's intentional and surpassing blessing and love. It's the same energy, the same power that gives and sustains all of life, all of life, and gives us hearts and gifts to connect with each other and serve. We can identify where it started and we surely can see no end to it. When we can live in that energy, how can we feel otherwise but grateful for the love that created us and all we are given and continues to create every moment? It's a divine dance, a divine outpouring of love and grace and gift. So today I want to talk about blessing. I'm using as a reference um, a work done by theologian, author, 
former Catholic priest, priest and current Episcopal priest, Matthew Fox, I'm sure you've heard of him, who has done so much to bring to the modern seeker the world of creation spirituality. This paradigm of creation spirituality embodies the idea of original blessing or original goodness. It is a fundamental shift in our theology, in our cosmology, it gives us a new answer to that age-old question of who are we? Where do we come from? That's one of the purposes of religion is to answer for all of us. That question is, who am I? Where, where did I come from? Where am I going? When we can shift to a paradigm of creation, spirituality, it gives us a new way, a new opportunity to radically reinterpret ourselves and our place in this dance of creation. It is mind-blowing. Matthew Fox spent many years as a, as a member of the Dominican order, but at some point he began to question what he saw as church doctrines that were anthropocentric. Um, I think I said that right, anthropocentric. That is what that means. It's a great word. What it means is it's putting humans at the, at the middle at the most important spot in all of creation. It's a, it's a human-centered definition of creation. Humans are more important than all other life. That is anthropocentric, uh, patriarchal, and not life-affirming. He saw the church doctrines as life-deadening, if you will, not life-affirming, not creation-centered. In the early 1990s, he was silenced for a year due to his work with the Institute of Culture and Creation Spirituality and his writings about creation spirituality as well, and this is where he's really started to go off the rails, uh, as well as his questioning of the doctrine of original sin. He called God mother and he worked with and integrated into his services and his teaching indigenous traditions. He was a professor at um, a Catholic university, and he invited to his classes as lecturers members of other faith traditions, including a Zen Buddhist and neo-pagan author and teacher, Starhawk. So this was a bit too much for those folks, and he was expelled from the Dominican order in 1993 after he refused to stop, and he continued to teach and write. He ultimately became a priest in the Episcopal Church. So Fox was influenced greatly by Thomas Merton, with whom he corresponded, and also by Meister Eckhart, the 13th century German Dominican theologian and mystic. Eckhart was truly, and we've talked about Meister Eckhart before, he was truly an extraordinary man for his time. He was ecumenical, visionary, unrestrained by the theology of his day. He was a very early proponent of creation spirituality, seeing the connection between God's creation around us and the divine spark within us. He called the divine spark ancilla animae, or the spark of the soul. This is one of the things Meister Eckhart wrote. He wrote, everything which God created millions of years ago and everything which will be, be created by God after millions of years, if the world lasts that long, God is creating all that in the innermost and deepest realms of the human soul. Everything of the past and everything of the present and everything of the future, God creates in the innermost realm of the soul. He saw life. He saw all creation as simply connected. Not surprisingly, Eckhart ultimately was tried as a heretic. At some point, I read an article, Fox gave an interview after he was um, um, basically thrown out of the Dominican order, in which he said he had to be doing something right because he was in such good company, citing Meister Eckhart. So these wisdom teachers were getting to a truth that can only be experienced, that experience of the holy. That's one of the things we teach here at One World, not learning about the holy, even though that's important and we do it, but also our efforts to help each one of us personally and directly experience the holy ourselves. They gave us and they taught a wisdom that celebrates all of creation, our unfolding understanding of its beauty, complexity, and depth. These teachers knew and they taught and they teach 
that truth is incarnational. The divine is in all that is, has been, and will be. The ramifications of that are many, and they are life-changing. When we realize that the holy is incarnational, dynamic, flowing, and ever-creating. So, what is creation spirituality? It is a cosmology or a theology that replaces an ethic of sin and fall and redemption with a celebration of goodness and blessing. With celebration of joy, the joy that we experience by being here in the midst of this beautiful and abundant creation. One of Fox's influence is um, the mystic Julian of Norwich, who wrote, I know well that heaven and earth and all creation are great, generous, and beautiful and good. God's goodness fills all his creatures and all his blessed works full and endlessly overflows in them. God is everything which is good as I see it, and the goodness which everything has is God. You got to read more of Julian of Norwich. It's beautiful stuff. In this cosmology, the universe, all of it, is fundamentally a blessing. Original sin becomes original blessing. It is a paradigm we can substitute for the tried and true paradigm of the fall and redemption, of sin and judgment that so many of us were taught and which has colored for so long our perception of Christianity and of faith. It may be surprising to learn that the doctrine of original sin has fairly skimpy biblical foundations. There's a line, I mean, this was amazing. There's a line in, in Psalm 20, 51 that says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. That's in Psalm 51. In Paul's letters to the Romans, he wrote, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. In addition to that, um, scholars point to the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden. There are other passages briefly that describe children as foolish, man's heart as evil from his youth. There really is not a lot more than that. The doctrine is never, it's nowhere expressed. It is a construct of this statement and that phrase and that thought in that translation. It was not until St. Augustine in the fourth century that the doctrine of original sin was articulated and it was formally adopted by later church councils. In contrast, Fox writes that creation-centered tradition has roots extending far earlier to Hebrew wisdom writings, to the prophets, to Jesus, who actually preached nothing about original sin, but spoke of love and healing and comfort and really justice for the poor and the displaced. Uh, for example, Fox points out that God's original covenant with the Jewish people was articulated in terms of blessing, of plenty. God said to Abraham, Go forth from the land of your kinsfolk and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the communities of the earth shall find blessing in you. Abram went as the Lord directed him. This is language of abundance, of goodness, of blessing, not condemnation or judgment. As author Ailey Wiesel pointed out, the concept of original sin is really alien to Jewish tradition. What these wisdom teachers teach us is to replace the paradigm of sin, fall, and redemption for a theology of joy, for a life-affirming theology of an ever-unfolding abundant creation. Fox gives us the notion of what he called the cosmic Christ, teaching that Christ is incarnate in all of creation, constantly creating. One of the things that he talks about which fascinated me was 
a paradigm he gives us of the word. We hear a lot about God's word. What is uh, at the beginning of the Hebrew scriptures? In the beginning was the word. So when we think about that word, word, what do we think of? We think of words like I am speaking or words that we read in a book. But what Fox tells us is that the meaning of that is so much more. The word of God is the creative energy itself. It is the life of God springing into manifestation as all of creation, as each of us, as every created thing, every tree, every item, every person, every being is a word of God created then and continually being created. As Fox puts it, blessing is the word behind the word, the desire behind the creation. What he's telling us is that the word of God, the creation of God, is driven by the desire to love and to bless. When we live within that cosmology, when we live within the, the paradigm of original blessing, how can we be anything but grateful? What we are looking at is a path away from Christianity's traditional, at least since the fourth century, teaching or paradigm of fall and redemption and sin and judgment. It's a movement away from the dualism, from the Augustinian guilt and shame, and toward a spirituality of joy, of celebration. So what Fox has done in his principles of creation spirituality is he has defined four paths. And these are four different ways, if you will, that we can experience and we do experience original blessing, that we live original goodness. So let me tell you a bit more about what these four paths are. The first is the path of awe. It's known as the via positiva. This is the path of wonder and joy and just awe at the beauty of creation around us. It is an inner response, an opening of our hearts to the beauty and the wonder of life and God. Eckhart wrote, Every creature is full of God and is a book about God. Every creature is God's word and thus a revelation of the divine. For this reason, we ought to apprehend God in all things, for God is in all things. I mean, that's a question for us. How would we live our lives differently if we really knew that God was in all beings and God was in all things? Father Thomas Berry speaks of the sacredness of being. The human venture depends absolutely on this quality of awe and reverence and joy in the earth and all that lives and grows upon the earth. In the end, the universe can only be explained in terms of celebration. Don't you love that? In the end, the universe can only be explained in terms of celebration. It is all an exuberant expression of existence itself. We must feel that we are supported by that same power that brought the earth into being, the power that spun the galaxies into space, that tilts the sun and brought the moon into its orbit. When we live in that energy, it is easy and natural to feel grateful. When we are sitting, basking in the glow of the Via Positiva, it's really a bhakti energy, a devotional, joyful, wonderful energy energy. But it's not the only one. It's only one of the four paths that bring us to wholeness, that tell us that we can live this celebration of creation in every aspect of our lives. The next one is the path of release, or what he calls the via negativa. This is the path of letting go and letting be, of solitude and silence. It's also the path of undergoing grief and sorrow. It's, a, it's a, a path of radical trust in the divine. Eckhart calls it sinking eternally into the one, and Merton called it an ever greater surrender. 
in this path, it's a path of silence and release and surrender. There is room. It's when we open up and empty out, creating room for grace. This is the space where we find the quiet corners of gratitude, not the big bang, the lights going off. It's the quiet part of gratitude, the quiet knowing that we are of the holy, that we are supported by the holy, that we sit in the embrace of spirit. It is a place really for quiet gratitude, but deep and profound gratitude nonetheless. The next is the path of creativity or the via creativa. It's a path, this is the path of creativity, of celebration, of co-creation with the work of the Holy Spirit. Merton called it the creative action of love and grace in our hearts. It's when we create art, music, poetry, it's creative expression as a path to the divine. Uh, Fox writes that his teacher, who was French theologian Père Chenu, at the age of 91 told Fox, never forget the greatest tragedy in theology of the last 300 years has been the divorce of the theologian from the dancer, the musician, the potter, the poet, the artist, and the filmmaker. What a true thought. It's all God. And we find the holy, we express the holy when we share these gifts, whatever your gift is, when we share it with others. Um, Fox, when he first arrived in this country, he went to California and he saw um, what they called raves. I don't know if you know what a rave is, but it's a mass gathering of people just celebrating in so many different ways. And so he created, on the model of these raves, he created something called the Cosmic Mass. And it, it, it involved music and dance and visual arts and the spoken word. Um, it was it just an amazing experience that he would put on to create, to share that energy of celebration, of joy in the creation in which we find ourselves. And the next path is the way of transformation or the via transformativa. This is the path it's what it says. It's the path of compassion and justice. It is the path of the prophet who calls us to transformation, who calls us to action. The Holy Spirit moves us not just to contemplate and think about divine compassion, but to stand up and walk out the front door and put it into action in the world in order to help others. Eckhart taught that compassion is justice. Merton, as a matter of fact, used this principle really to redefine the concept of obedience. We were being obedient to creation, to the dictates of the holy when we extend justice to the dispossessed, when we lift up the suffering, when we extend the message of Christ to all beings. When we walk these four paths, taken together, they lead us to wholeness, to balance. Blessing is found in each in a different way, but all together, they give us an integrated and a whole way to experience the blessing of creation. As Rabbi Abraham Heschel put it, just to be is a blessing. Just to live is holy. If we can walk out of here with nothing else today, let's choose that, that energy. Just to be is a blessing. Just to live is holy. So thank you for listening. I'd like to close with a reading that I really like from Thomas Merton. And it's about gratitude and the love of God. He wrote, To be grateful is to recognize the love of God in everything he has given us. And he has given us everything. Every breath we draw is a gift of his love. Every moment of existence is a grace. For it brings with it immense graces from him. 
Gratitude, therefore, takes nothing for granted, is never unresponsive, is constantly awakening to new wonder and to praise of the goodness of God. For the grateful person knows that God is good, not by hearsay, but by experience. And that is what makes all the difference.